All righty. Well, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're listening from. Welcome and thank you once again for turning into the uh, Perspectives on Leadership podcast brought to you by Fire Engineering. My name is Steve Shaw. I'm very proud to be an assistant chief of Fort Lauderdale Fire Rescue, and I'm honored to be part of the fire engineering family as an author, as a presenter at FDIC, and as a host for this podcast. I know that there are a host of amazing podcasts out there, and I am truly honored and humbled that you are choosing this one to listen to. Um, I am a consummate student of leadership, and I am grateful for this platform for the value that it provides those who listen and for the opportunity it provides me to grow as a leader within Fort Lauderdale Fire Rescue. As we all return from FDIC this last uh, couple of weeks, uh, this, this idea means more to me than ever. During the last conversation I had with Chief Halton, he mentioned how FDIC was a tactics conference, not just with firefighting, but everything from leadership to training to mentorship, whatever. And then no matter what we taught or presented that, or we spoke on, that we should be focused on the tactical ways for our listeners or readers to model or deploy these ideas in the real world. So in that spirit, and in his honor, I will continue to focus on the tactics as well as the concepts. So I will always want to give him thanks. Um, I, I continue to be fascinated by how our perspectives affect our ability to lead. A perspective is the lens in which you see through, but it can also be that lens that other people see through as well. So whatever you call it, mindset, viewpoint, angle, uh, perspective is a very powerful tool in the toolbox of a leader. The goal for this podcast continues to be pretty straightforward, to take a concept for a trait that we associate with leadership and dive deep down that rabbit hole. So our fire rescue service is filled with amazing leaders and each have their own perspectives on leadership. I wanna be able to pick their brains and allow them to provide as many tactical, immediately deployable takeaways as possible for the listener. I am forever grateful to fire engineering and for Chief Halton for allowing me to have this platform so that I can do that my part to pass it on to my brothers and sisters in the fire service. So I've had a, I've had amazing opportunities recently uh, to meet a very influential fire service leaders in my travels. And to me, it's one of the greatest gifts of this career, developing those interesting, powerful relationships of all kind. Um, I first met Nick Papa at the 2022 Mickle Beg Leadership and Tactics Conference held in Celebration, Florida. Now, if you didn't know, in 2002, Lieutenant John Mickle and Firefighter Dallas Begg from the Osceola County Fire Department died during a live training exercise, and their deaths led to the adoption of NFPA 1403 for Florida law for our training burns. So if you ever get a chance to go to that conference, these guys do it right, not only by hosting a great conference, but they truly live by the words, and they practice this, never forget. So I just want to make sure I give them the, 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 the credit they're due. Anyway. I find myself influenced by people throughout the fire service. In the short time that I've got to know Nick, he's influenced me in a very positive way. And I've reached out to him several times to discuss all kinds of things from how to turn an article into a book or to how to make the best cup of coffee. So that's where I'd like to focus on today. Not the coffee, but, but everything in between. Um, but influence. Uh, I personally am drawn to the word influence as a leadership trait because it is by itself agnostic. It says nothing of rank time on the job, volunteer versus career, color, creed, sexual orientation, religion, uh, anything. It also says nothing about being good or bad. We influence people every, every day, all around us, all the time. And we have the choice on how and what that looks like in terms of influence. So just a brief, update, or brief bio on Nick. He's a captain with the New Britain Fire Department where he has served for over 15 years. He's a second generation firefighter. He entered into the fire service in 2003, volunteering for a neighboring suburb until his appointment into the New Britain Fire Department. He's a fire engineering author and an FDIC instructor. He served as a technical panelist for the FSRI coordinated fire attack study. Nick is also the founder of the fire service training organization, Fireside Training. So before I give him the mic, I, there's three things that came to my mind as I was prepping for this conversation. The first, and these are gonna sound weird, it always does. The first one is, is writing in cursive. So it, it, every so often you meet somebody that you just you just jive with. So I'm sitting next to Nick at this conference last year, and he's taking notes in a notebook just like I do, except he's writing in this amazingly detailed and perfect handwriting in cursive. And I looked over, and I'm like, dude, are you writing in cursive? I haven't wrote in cursive in years. And he said something to the effect that you, you learn more from it or something. And I don't know what triggered, but since that day, I've been starting to write in cursive every time I take notes. And I often find myself cursing Nick because of that, but that's another story for another day. Uh, the second thing I wanted to talk about is the book Coordinating Ventilation. Um, 
or the, th the same thing that came to mind, that is. And it, it had me by the cover. If you look at the cover and you know who I am, it, when you got a guy holding a rotary saw getting ready to work on the front of any book, I'm already sold. I'm already in. So I was sold before we, I even opened the page. But I would like to dive into how that developed and how what was supposed to be an article kind of cre basically created a, a, or came, became a book. And the last thing I want to talk about, and this is going to get weird, but I want to talk about coffee. So we both have this love for a good cup of coffee. But when he started telling me that he roasts his own beans and he has this chemistry set like setup at the firehouse in his house, I was intrigued and floored. And I thought, you know, as happy as I was meant to, to, to met this guy talk about coffee, I also was happy that here's another guy who's found hobbies or skills or trades or something outside the fire service. And what I mean by that is, and don't get me wrong, it's absolutely okay and awesome that we can love the job, but it's also very necessary to have mechanisms or outlets to cope with those very stresses that comes with the job. So anyway, um, that being said, Nick, thank you for being on here today. And I'm just really happy that we have this chance to, to chat and talk shop. Uh, pleasure's all mine, brother. Uh, I really appreciate the invite to come on here and uh, echo all your sentiments. I mean, it's the, the greatest gift of being able to to get out on the road and teach is to to meet the the amazing folks that we cross paths with and to not only get to talk shop but as you said to just talk about life and to learn about uh, learn all about different things from different people and to tie it all back to what your podcast is all about gain more perspective yeah, then that's that that's what this life is all about it's it's developing these relationships and these connections and we're we're social creatures and that's what what makes life what it is it's the people who who come into our lives and and positively influence us so that's i, I love how this all of these themes are just intertwining and it's going to make for a, a really good conversation because i think a lot of these these concepts are going to dovetail together and we're going to tie it all all together at the end with a, a pretty abstract uh conversation with coffee to really kind of blend it all together. <laughs> uh, yeah, hundred hundred percent, man. And, and even just right there, you're right. We're social creatures. And I find myself more these days really, really paying attention to the relationships more than ever. And maybe that's because I'm coming close to retirement in seven years or uh, reflecting. I, I don't know what it is, but you're right. And I'm really focusing on those relationships, especially those, those single digit number of really good ones that are going to last throughout the years, even after we retire and do other things. So you and I just came back from presenting at FDIC in Indianapolis. And, um, you know, for you, you've been, you've been doing it for several years. For me, it was my second time. And it's always been not only an amazing experience, but very just uh, sobering, you know, because you know you're on stage, you know you're, you're, you're representing your organization, you're representing yourself, you're representing FDIC and fire engineering. Um, but when you, when you walk away, when you go back home, what are your takeaways? Like, what do you do next? What's your processing mechanism like when you have that and then you kind of go back home? What does that look like for you? Again, I'm going to tie it back to relationships. The beautiful part about FDIC, especially having been out there for, for a handful of years now, you really get to to foster these these friendships, these relationships. And, you know, after the, the first couple, the, the first year or two, when you really start to get your sea legs because FDIC is very overwhelming. I mean, you in downtown Indianapolis with 35,000 other people with anybody who's anybody, whether it's manufacturers, uh, instructors, everybody is in one place at one time. And it's, it's a lot. So it's, I think just that first year, it's very overwhelming. The second year you really start to get your sea legs. And now, you know, you start to develop these, these friendships with other, other instructors, other, you know, people that you, are regular attendees and it becomes a really great experience because you're not only i mean we're going as presenters but we're also equally there as students you know we're fdic and fire engineering clary and they, they invest in us as instructors to they bring us out there put us up and but then they also give us the the access pass to now develop ourselves even further and and we get to spend the rest of our time being students and, and learning ourselves so then it's the the, the social network of getting to meet up with you know, there's some people that you only see once a year at fdic and just to make every opportunity to, and, and make the best of the experience to to meet up with as many of those people as you can and, and spend that time together catching up talking shop and 
it's for me that that is the, the biggest piece of it is those conversations that you have out to lunch or out to dinner or at the bar or just running into somebody on the street or in the hallway at the convention center. Those are the ones that that are really impactful. I mean, I had you know tremendous conversation with you know some of my you know who would be people who have become really good friends and even just letting that those conversations kind of ferment in the days or week after FDIC and then following up with those guys with phone conversations and they really help kind of dial you in because a, a lot of the guys that that are out there are dealing with the same things that that we are oh, and <laughs> talk about perspective sometimes we can feel like we're we're on an island or we're dealing with this novel situation when in all reality there's so many other folks that are de- that are battling the same issues that that, that we are so in, in order to have that perspective and also hear other people's you know take on things or what they're going through how they're dealing with it, it is invaluable and it, I, I can't i can't express the the value of that enough it's you know and, and you're right and I, I going back to the relationships thing i i purposely on this on this last presentation i gave my class homework i gave my class homework and gave them basically an assignment to one identify an instructor that had, had influenced them in some way Two, reach out to them call them and have a conversation and thank them and then email me back and what that looked like and i am so glad i did that because I've now maintained relationship with this this group of people that we're now going back and forth. And the results of that, that homework has been awesome. I mean, everything from, hey, I reached out to this guy. We had a good conversation. Thanks for making me do that, too. I just got off the phone after two hours and we were in tears reminiscing. Thank you for having me do that. I'm like, damn. But now just the, the back and forth with them, it feels like I'm able to continue the conversation. You know, it wasn't just a one shot. Hey, have a nice day. Good luck. It's uh, now it's a dialogue. And so it's wonderful to develop those relations, like you said, and whether it's meeting other presenters, uh, other students, the fire service. Yeah, man. And I think that the key word you said there is fostering relationships. I think I, I'm glad that that we have that opportunity to meet so many people. And you mentioned not only just at the presentations, but or being a student, but at lunch, dinner, the bars, there's so many places to have those interactions and to meet people uh, and it, and like you said, the 35,000 people, it's highly likely you have that opportunity. So, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, 100%, but I'm glad. Tremendous thing that, that you did in that action because so often there, there's a disconnect between the attendees and the presenter. And for what for whatever reason, there's this perception that, you know, they're, they're not approachable or oh, I, I, I can't reach out to the, this person. It, for what, whatever reason, but in all reality, it's that's what we're all there for. We're we're there to provide you know information to allow people to be better versions of themselves, both on and off the fire ground. To learn from you know our experiences, from a, a lot of which are born, at least for me, anyways, are born out of uh, out of error and mistake. So that's the whole point. That's why we're there. We're there to pa- pass on that information. And you know we want to you know help people out, or we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. And I, I wouldn't be sitting in front of you today if I hadn't reached out to to somebody who was on, on the teaching circuit and had asked them for help. Then that that conversation by me putting myself out there and asking this person who I'd never met before, had no relationship with, but asked them for help on on a project, it turned it snowballed and and here I am today and that's what got me in, involved with fire engineering so it, it's, it's something as simple as you know just reaching out and and putting yourself out there and making a contact to one of these these authors one of these instructors you know could be as simple as answering a question or could turn into you know what what happened with me is that now I'm sitting in front of you today doing this podcast because of an email I wrote reaching out to a, 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 another instructor that was on the, the national circuit. Yeah, yeah. now it's huge. Um, well, let's let's transition over to the book. Now, I, I, I want to talk about the book because I know that I've called you on this a couple of times and we've talked about how that came to be. So I'm just curious how you were able to get to that point. So in terms of the book, we're in ventilation. How did that evolve? Where did the impetus that come from? What led to the beginning to where it is today? How how that how that look? So with 
cl with classic to, to how things kind of typically work with me. It's I tend to do things a little bit unorthodox. And I had written a handful of articles and writing a book wasn't on my radar at the time for the near future. It w was something that's been on my bucket list since I was since I was a teenager. Just for whatever reason, I was never big into writing uh, in school, but for some reason, uh, actually, it's not, it's not for some reason. I know uh, Chief Vincent Dunn had was one of my first, you know, major, you know, outside influences, if you will. And sitting in the firehouse as a kid, I, going through boxes of old magazines, I came across Chief Dunn's monthly uh, editorial. And I just love that the way he was able to convey information in such a simplistic way. And it really resonated with me. And that's what really triggered me. It was like, man, I, I, how incredible it must it be to be able to give back to the fire service on this level, to be able to impart this kind of information and, and wisdom on, on others, to be able to, to help out people across the country. So that's what really kind of, I think, planted the seed of, of wanting to, to write in, in the fire service and, and educate at, at that level through that medium. And it, it had always been in the back of my mind of w wanting to write a book because that's the kind of the pinnacle of of writing. And at FDIC 2019, I got approached by uh, Jim Silvernail and Arthur Ashley, who they were collaboratively uh, trying to write a book together on you know, non-conventional truck company operations. So with most of the the, uh, the American Fire Service not having the luxury of a dedicated truck company, you know, they wanted to write a, a book that kind of focused in on how you could accomplish the truck functions, regardless of whether or not you have the dedicated crew in the apparatus. So they asked if I could write the ventilation and fire dynamics chapter for them. So of course I graciously accepted and was honored to do so. And the way I operate is, is I'm, I have that sled dog mentality. So once you once you set me off, I'm 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 gone. So I got home, and of course I just um full front sight focused on getting this done. I start hammering away on the keyboard, and lo and behold, I I get I don't know 10, 15,000 words put down on paper. So I sent it out to them, and of course they're like, "Wow, this is above and beyond what we expected. This is great." So I get done, and I'm totally unfulfilled completely unfulfilled because I'm like, I have more to say, I'm not done yet. So I kept writing and writing and now I'm at 25,000 words. And I'm thinking to myself, I wanna write my own damn book. So <laughs> I reached out to, to Fire Engineering and I had uh, worked with uh, Mark Huff from the books and videos department on a, on a DVD project the previous year. So I called him up and I pitched the idea to him. I said, hey, I know this is kind of backwards, but I have a working manuscript. Here's the concept. He liked it, passed me along to Chris Barton, uh, one of the editors. And it, kind of the, the rest was history. It was, uh, although, of course, he dropped the bomb on me. But he's like, yeah, that's great. You're at 25,000 words, but you, uh, you're you only halfway to the, the, the boilerplate uh, word count. So again, you know, back to the drawing board, start hammering away. And uh, about a, I think it was a year and a half total from when I got asked to write that chapter to when I had a, a completed working manuscript. So it was, uh, again, a, an unconventional accidental journey, but something that uh, I'm, I'm so glad that it, that it happened because it really just, it gave me the, that, that drive to, to fulfill that, that bucket list dream of, of writing a book. And uh, from the feedback I've been getting, it's, it's accomplished the objective, which is for it to be, a purposeful and, and to be of use to the fire service. That's all I care about is that, you know, people can take what I've learned through my experiences, through a lot of my, my errors on the fire ground, be able to take the, take them, understand what happened, why it happened, and to know that those landmines are there so they don't have to step in the same ones and hopefully prevent somebody from getting into a jam or allow them to do their job that much more effectively is all that matters. That's that's why we exist as fire service educators is to allow people to not uh, not repeat um, the same mistakes that we have or avoidable mistakes, and then allow them to to be that much better. That's the the whole point of all this. So um, I'm ecstatic to to hear from the people I've uh, that have given me feedback that 
it has hit that mark. So that's that's all I could ask for. No, and there's a lot there, and I, I'm glad you went through that, and and for several reasons. One, we we always tell people out there that if they have a passion or if they have a, a significant call that they're on or something that they're really interested in, you know, write an article. Everything from fire engineering, we're always telling people write articles, write articles, and I don't think they realize how powerful those not only can be for us in terms of what you're talking about, sharing information, helping people learn. It's not about bravado. It's not about hey, look at me. It's hey, here's something that may benefit you or help you or keep you safer. And I think if you look at it with that perspective, it, it gives you the permission to go, OK, I, I, I know why I'm writing this now. And um, so that you, you, you definitely said a lot there. Uh, but again, going back to the listener here, it, we say this all the time. You know, if you have that that passion about something, put it on words, even if you're not a good writer. I was talking to Bill Gustin a little while ago. Apparently he sucks at writing, but he's got a ton of knowledge. So when he turns it in, the editors go, oh, hey, Bill, and they, they crack and, and change everything to make it presentable. <laughs> but with the same token, uh, we need those people to pass along their knowledge, especially today when there's so much more new things coming out and there's people that are, you know, into things. We, we need to hear your voices. So but I'm glad that this this transition for you the way it did, because it is one of those valuable tools. Now. Well, the one thing that, that I found was that there was a tremendous void with Ventilation had really fallen off the radar over the last five plus years. It got a lot of attention after the 2010 and 2013 UL studies that were done. But then the conversation very quickly shifted to fire attack because there was the big you know, debate over the transitional versus interior and you know the contentious the contentiousness that followed after that, which thankfully that pendulum has landed back to where it needs to be in the center. <laughs> Uh, but ventilation had just about all been forgotten about. And I realized that yeah, we had learned so much from those studies, but there wasn't a central document that really took all of this information and kind of just synthesized it down into very simplistic terms for the street level firefighter or fire officer to just digest and develop a, a more a practical understanding of how it worked and how to better apply it. And when I was doing the research for my presentation, because essentially the book is the written version of my, my lecture. And when I started going through, I have over a hundred different sources that I use to put this, uh, this program together. And I thought to myself, I go, man, I, I think about the thousands and thousands of hours that I have in R and D, whether it's reading books and a lot of those books were old books i mean you go back to some of them 150 200 years ago back to james braidwood or you know to the uh, 70s with emmanuel freed and a lot of this stuff was documented this isn't anything the concepts or the principles aren't landmark they're not new we just have new data that actually uh, the new empirical data that's basically providing the basis and and the the proof, if you will, for what was in the past just experiential or anecdotal. Now we actually have that that data to back up what our pre-SCBA and pre-turnout gear predecessors knew instinctively or intuitively all those years ago. Now we actually just have a, a way of of painting that picture with facts and data. And so that was my big driver was, you know, I'm extremely into the job. I and I take things to the kind of the, the nth degree with the way I approach them. And I, and I thought to myself, I was like, wow, I had to go through, find old books on eBay, dig up old WNYF articles, you know, all these classes I've sat through, you know, conversations I've had because of the relationships I've been able to foster with just being blessed with being able to, to teach out on the road and the podcasts I've listened to. So that's thousands and thousands of hours of an investment where the, the average firefighter may not have the ability to do so, whether it's it's time, uh, resources, you name it. And it's it's a lot. It, we, you shouldn't have to jump through those hoops just to get foundational knowledge to be able to to do your job and to to develop that that practical, you know, more in-depth level of understanding. So that was my big driver too, was to make this information one, you know, easily digestible, you know, breaking it, it all down and synthesizing it and adding that context. 
and then make it readily accessible to, to people so that they can readily obtain it and apply it to the fire ground. All right, I, I definitely appreciate that. And that's a, that's a great explanation of, of everything you put together on this. And, and you're right, it, it takes work, a lot of work, and you put a lot of work into it. So it's definitely appreciated. And, and you, it, we were, I was talking this week to our officers, we were doing officer development class, and we talked about the concept of, you know, your, your words are powerful. And when you, you influence somebody, that's powerful. But make sure you carefully curate your content. There's so much out there right now that you have to make sure what you're saying is the correct thing. It's properly referenced. It's it's you know searchable because people are searching. They're on their phones today, double checking everything. So that the fact that you did the right work, you did and I gave not only gave credit to where it was due, but validated all your stuff. That's that speaks volumes. Yeah. No pun intended. It's <laughs> speaking volumes. <laughs> um, I got I got a few questions here. I'm kind of bouncing around a little bit, but. Um, and I did want to talk about some of our hobbies. And I'm not sure if we should talk about that at the end to wrap things up or in the middle right here. But um, uh, I'm not sure. What do you think? Should we talk about the hobbies later on or should we talk about the hobbies now? Yeah, I think the hobby is a good way to to, to tie it all together because <laughs> right. we can readily good. segue into the coffee and, and the finish it out. So I think both of us, and maybe that's why we kind of you know kind of just, uh, just gelled. We have some interesting hobbies. Now, for me, I make soap at home and I make handcrafted beer at home. And whenever I tell people that, they're like, you do what? And I always bring, you know, little bars of soap with me to my classes. And it, it always, it's, a, it's a, the funniest thing when I'm passing out bars of soap to people that actually get up and, and, and input into the class. But for me, it's, and this goes back to my wife. Um, my wife's a psychologist. And when she was doing her research for a dissertation, she uh, came to me after doing a, a load of research on firefighters, especially in my department, and said, listen, I'm noticing a couple trends. And I'm definitely... Uh, downgrading the conversation we have but basically she said well first of all i noticed your sleep patterns suck and i'm like yeah tell me about it. our sleep patterns absolutely suck but that's another talk for another day but she also says we have issues with coping we have issues with processing all the stresses that we deal with in the job and i find that for me for example when i go home I, and, and that outlet for me is not only hanging out with my family but the little craft things i get involved with whether it's soap beer or, or teaching so uh, for you um how do yours? How does that all tie in? I mean, go through some of your the hobbies you have and kind of how that ties in. So again, we this this is where you and I are very much on the same level because I'm I love to figure things out and I love to to make my own my own things. You know, being able to create is is such a, an incredible experience. And I've dabbled in soap making my myself at, at home just because of. You know, weird allergies and some uh, and some of that thing. I've and, I, and I'm I'm a big health nut too. So that you're trying to, I'm always trying to find products that have the least amount of chemicals in them mm -hmm. to you know, just you know, keep things as natural as possible. So I I, I experimented my, myself with ma making soaps. I know that was kind of the 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 leading conversation that we had uh, on our, our the first day that we met down in Florida, which kind of just kicked things off for us. But yeah, um. For me, along those same lines is of being able to to have that creative outlet. Uh, cooking is is a real big one for for me. I, um, I grew up in a, a Italian Sicilian house, and uh, my family has uh, has always been big into cooking. Uh, my mom cooks and bakes. My dad, you know, my dad cooks, and I learned to cook from 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 them and from my my grandmother on my dad's side. And it's always been you know, that, that uh, meals have always been a huge uh, uh, have been a huge importance in my family, which is why one of the one of the many reasons why I love the fire service because of the the importance that the the, the kitchen table has the the meals and you know cooking the meals breaking bread together uh, that there's so much of that that family aspect that I that I love and so that so that for me is the being able to 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 create things and not only that but it's your you're sharing that creation with other people and i think food is kind of one of those binding uh, things that brings everybody together and uh, no matter what goes on and how crazy the day gets when you all sit around the, the table together and and enjoy a meal together it's like everything else just kind of melts away and you you just have that that shared experience over you know, the, over food it's it's a power it's a powerful thing and i, I love being able to to experiment and i uh, and just free freestyling and it's such a creative outlet that i i I'm, there's nothing like being home on the weekend especially on a, on a nice sunday 
blasting some good tunes in the kitchen and maybe having a good bottle of wine open and, you know, a little for cooking, little for the cook. And it's, it's a lot of fun. And then just being able to share that, that creation that you, you know, just spent the last couple hours putting together with, with your family, with your friends is such a great, a great thing. Uh, it's, that's one of my, I'd say my creative outlets along with, with writing. And then uh, on the physical side of things, which I think is tremendously important, you talk about the importance of uh, of a work life balance and having hobbies and outlets outside of the fire service. So I, I can't stress enough, especially for those of us that are very task oriented and are constantly trying to be productive. You gotta hit the pause button uh, regularly and have that that outlet and to just be able to to move your body and and just let your mind check out for a little bit. And for me, that's jujitsu and rock climbing. And to the funny part is there's so many parallels with the fire service as on as far as the decision making and keeping your composure on the fire ground with those two pieces, because both of those activities, because I I favor more bouldering, which is the low level climbing without rope uh, versus the top roping where you're climbing higher and you're you're tethered to a rope. I like that because I'm not much of an endurance person. I like more of the short explosive t- type of uh, of climbs. So if you look at both of those environment, both you know, rolling in jujitsu where you're actively you're sparring against somebody or you're doing a, a, a bouldering problem. You you don't have time to think. You just have to act. It's very instinctive and you have to be in very present and in the moment. So you can't have any other mental clutter going on. And it's the one of uh, one of my coaches that I, that I used to train with is a corrections officer by trade. And he he lo- he said something at uh, at training one night, which I really loved. And he called the ju- uh, jujitsu mat therapy because he said it's the only time the only time when you really can shut your brain off because he's this, he's wired the same way a lot of us are. Because if you if you're not present in the, in the moment, you're getting choked out. Because if you're not if you don't have the presence of mind to be aware of what's going on and actively engaged with your opponent, you're done. So I love that. It, and it really is that mat therapy or that wall therapy, you know, for climbing, because it allows you to just shut that, that logical part of your brain off and just get lost in, in the moment of what you're doing and tap into that, that instinctive mind of, and then just moving your body, which I can't stress the importance of that enough. You, you need to have that physical outlet to be able to just dump all that that stress and everything that we carry uh, throughout the day. So, so I'm going to try to contain this conversation, or at least my response to it, because I have a feeling that this literally could take us to 5 p.m. today. So you said a lot there, but everything you said is so crucial for us to understand as first responders. I mean, just everything from the idea of the kitchen table. And it's not just a kitchen table. It is where we come to solve the problems of the world, eat together, break bread. It is sacred ground. It is hollowed earth, that area. And you know, every time someone mentioned the kitchen table, it always kind of gives me that moment of pause of how special it is. But you mentioned a couple of things, the ability to create something, and that's powerful. And there's a lot to to dive into there. Um, I think to me, what you said in terms of the two most powerful words you said in this whole thing, well, many, but just two that spoke to me, shared experiences. Shared experiences. And I've used this a lot in a lot of presentations recently. It's been a topic of conversation in many of, of my talks with whoever I'm talking with is the idea that whether it's training, the calls we respond to, the things we do together after hours or after the work's over, you're generating these shared experiences that are very powerful in developing not only a team, but relationships and, and bonding. And there's so much to, to be said about that, that shared experience. Um, but what I'm going to be taking away today from this short little blurb is the idea that the things you mentioned, whether it was the jujitsu or the rock climbing, those are things that, that force you to focus. You can't have your mind somewhere else. And I think that right there is what I'm going to be walking away today is, is those things that you're doing on the side. 
they're, they're important because not only they give you the outlet, but they make you disconnect. They make you focus on something else and put you in the moment. So, yeah, man, you, 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 there's a lot to break down there. And I, I, may, I may go back and listen to this a few times. I'm glad I'm writing this down because there's just good stuff here, man. And I like the math therapy thing. <laughs> I was telling somebody yesterday when I was when I was teaching at FDIC, I was talking to my buddy. I'm like, you know, I do it because I love to do it. But you understand that this is therapy for me. I need to to do this, to be in front of people and to have that interaction and develop those relationships. It's my therapy because at my level, the assistant chief, I don't get to do that in my department much these days. And I miss that so much. Um, anyway, so, yeah, <laughs> that's a lot, man. I'm glad we, yeah. we dove into that. The other thing it's really good for too, and I I I absolutely love it. And when you walk into our our gym, my coach has a desk right in the the front foyer area, and on the front of the desk, which is adjacent to where the the shoe rack is, where you, when you take your shoes off, there's a sign that says, "Please leave your shoes and your ego at the door." And it <laughs> and it's perfect. And I, I got to say, like my my coach has done a tremendous and and just. The people that have been at the, the gym for a long time, they've really done a tremendous job of of curating a an, a, a really positive environment. And my, my coach is a, a, a big like old school punk rock, uh, punk rock guy. And it was one of his favorite bands was was Bad Brain. So that this whole he always the, the gym is actually called Soulcraft, which is a Bad Brain song. And, you know, it was one of his his kind of monikers was that positive mental attitude. And that's where you know, he really in, has has created that environment where, you know, there's there's no BS at the gym. I mean, if if somebody comes in with, uh, you know, the chest out bravado and is not there for the right reasons or is just doesn't possess the that right mindset, they either quickly adjust or they quickly leave. Uh, so the gym does a very good job of policing its uh, policing itself and and keeping that that positive mental attitude in that gym. And he's it's, he's really created uh, this kind of little this little tribe, this little community. And it's it go it, it's a good kind of testament and where you know that the fire service needs to, it should be doing the the same the same thing within our the little microcosms of the, of everybody's firehouses. Engine five, engine Hang on eight, just a second. ladder one. Car three, car seven, fire alarm. That's you got to go. No, it's just a fire alarm, so we're good. Um, But yeah, it's it's an important important example for for the fire service because that transcends right over. So if you're in, it doesn't matter if you're in a formal position of authority as a company officer or a shift commander, uh, or if you're a, a a, a senior firefighter or you know middle of the road firefighter it doesn't matter you know you everybody in you talk about influence influence transcends rank and just like leadership is not synonymous with rank it's it, it, so it talk about positive positive influence you know you need to whatever you value you need to model that and then also it's a, the on the accountability end of it too because it's it's not what you preach it's what you tolerate is what it all ultimately boils down to is you could have all the value statements, mission statements that you want in the world. And at the end of the day, it, it's, it's just, it's just words on paper. It's what you model in your actions. It's what you tolerate. And more importantly too, it's, it's what you tolerate from those around you too, because leading by example only goes so far. It's that's where you, it needs to start. But so much of it is you need to make sure that we're, we're keeping each other in check to make sure that we're we're all modeling those those values that they're they're shared values. It's all well and good that that I that I hold these certain values and keep myself to them. But I need to make sure that those around me are embodying those as well, because that's how you develop that that true culture, because culture is really it's it's shared values and beliefs and uh, all, all towards a, a common goal or a common mission. That's what what develops that that culture. So just just like what my coach has been able to create at the gym, that's what you know every firehouse should in, in essence be striving to do is you know creating that that positive mental attitude and you know that shared mission of you know protecting life and property. That's the mission of the fire service, and we need to, that that's our mission. 
we need to come up with that and you know share share the same you know beliefs and and values when it comes to th th that mission and then just keeping each other accountable to to hold true to that yeah man and you said a lot there in terms of culture the, the shared value and beliefs and um and a lot of it had to do with integrity making sure the actions match the word but then taking it one step further making sure your crew and your people are are, are exemplifying those as well and that kind of transitions to the next thing i wanted to talk about and Chief Holton always reminded me about the tactical takeaways, and I'm so glad I had that conversation with him before he passed. It was uh, just I'm, I'm I'm I always will remember that last conversation I had with him. But in terms of tactical takeaways, what are some ways we can practice or encourage the idea of influence in our circle? So, like tactical takeaways for our people. I think you already mentioned a couple, but let's focus in on that a second. What are your thoughts on that? The the one thing I'm going to really home in on is. This idea that I, when influence is typically talked about, it's usually in this like unilateral sense that it, influence is usually discussed from the top down approach and I'm influencing to subordinates or to peers when in reality, especially as you for me at, in that that middle management position as a captain, it's important for me just to, it's just as important for me to influence to my peers and to the uh, to, to subordinates those at lower uh, lower ranks but it's equally if not more important for me to influence up the chain of command as well because in the, the new position that i'm at right now uh, i actually report directly to the fire chief and i'm still a you know technically a a, a line officer uh, a suppression officer. So I have this unique perspective of still being uh, working with the the suppression crews on a day to day basis and working overtime in the fire companies. So I still am at the firehouse kitchen table, you know, having coffee and, and break and bread with those crews. But at the same token, it, it, I'm also working with uh, administration, working with the chief and assistant chief on strategic initiatives and and working on you know management level projects so for me i kind of it's imp i take it very seriously and i feel like one of my most important roles in this new position is to make sure that that uh, my chief and assistant chief have an idea of what the pulse of the membership is because i'm that much closer to them than they are and and have and have those those daily discussions with them where because just the time constraints and and schedules and priorities they don't get to do that as often as they as I'm sure they would they would like so now it's in it's incumbent upon me to to be that conduit of information up the chain of command as well so when you know they're trying to to roll out a new uh, a new initiative or uh, um, they're they have an idea or, of something that they want to do you know i can be that sounding board for them or you know as as things are, st are starting to brew or i can pass that information up the chain of command to say hey chief here's you know here's kind of what's what's going on down at the uh, at the apparatus floor floor level and you know here's kind of the, the grumblings i'm getting here's some of the the insights that i can provide you as to you know where the the membership is at and I think that's invaluable because at the chief and assistant chief level, though, that you're at that 30,000 foot view and, you know, you see the, the that strategic vision, but you need to also have that tactic, the, the tactical implications need to be cons considered just as well. And I think it's also, in, you talk about perspective. Perspective is, is important from the, the troops as well, because at the end of the day, they're the the end user, if you will, of, of the policies and procedures that are that are funneled down from the top positions. So in order to have that buy in, you need to understand where their heads are at. So that's where I try to, to influence and, and lead up the chain of command by providing that insight, providing that perspective for my chief and assistant chief to make to make more informed decisions by providing them with that that invaluable information of where the heads are at of the the street level firefighter and fire officer it's 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 surreal because i feel like 
you, you mentioned it before, you know, depending on where you go, a lot of the things are the same. I mean, we're not dealing with novel concepts. You know, a lot of times whatever we're dealing with here in our firehouse is across in California or Massachusetts or wherever. What you just said right there is exactly what I was preaching this week to our officers. I mean, and I'm so glad because it's it's validating, it's vindicating um, the fact that we are influencing both up and down the chain. But in terms of, first of all, your spot in training is a magical spot. I mean, it is probably the, and, I, and I'm, I'm biased because I, I spent time in the training bureau too. It is the best spot in the fire service. You get to be with the folk, you get to be training with them, you get to still work the streets, and yet you're still in the admin stuff to work on larger level projects that impact the entire organization. It is the most, if you had to choose an admin spot, and whoever's listening, if you have to choose an admin spot, it is probably the sexiest spot you're going to get in admin, okay? <laughs> Uh, and it's not bad. It's a great position to be in and talking to influence and feeling the pulse. Um, but you, in terms of the, the membership and then uh, go above, above and below where your your position is, I remember saying to the people I was uh, teaching last week that their superpower, we talk about mid-level managers, officers and the battalion chiefs right around that level, your superpower becomes the ability to interpret or or in or translate a message, whether it's from the fire chief down because you know your people, because you know them so well, you can translate that message so they can understand it. But then on the other side, as you're you're working with them, you're feeling the pulse, as you said, you're hearing their gripes or concerns or frustrations. We, you have the ability to translate it up say in the same way, the same path, just backwards. And there's a lot of power with that. And I think that we try to be very intentional about telling our officers that's exactly what we want to hear. Not only are you interpreting the message downstream, but you have to talk to us. Let us know what's going on out there because you have that wonderful position to see everybody and get the, the, the feel of the, of the folk out there. So, so it's, it's, it's a two-way street, though, too. And, and yep. you have to, if you want to have that influence, and I'm going to steal a line from, from my chief because he, he loves to make this analogy is you have to make a lot of deposits in the bank for when you're looking to win because the one day there's going to come a time when you're going to want to make a withdrawal and if you don't have that that surplus that that income built built up in the bank you're going to be in the red you know, and it's not a good that's not a good place to be so where again you're talking about that that two-way flow it's leading up it's leading down and where my where i have to be I have to pay my dues is when I'm at the firehouse kitchen table at the apparatus floor or on the drill grounds and the the rumors pop up or the insinuations pop up or or why are they doing this? I don't understand this. And that where the, the usual gripes come from. Well, that's where it's my job to advocate for the administration and provide that insight for them, because, again, the, the chief and assistant chief just there's there's just not enough hours in the day for them to yep. get the face time with every member to be able to have those conversations and yeah in a perfect world it would be it would be awesome if they could stop down for coffee or stop down for a meal all the time and be able to answer those questions and provide that trans that that level of transparency um, but that's where in my position because I have those conversations because I'm privy to uh, a, a lot of what's going on on the strategic level of what's coming down the pike. I try to do that as much as possible for them to say, hey, guys, you know, squash the, you know, squash the rumors and, and squash the insinuations and say, hey, here's what's actually going on or here. Hey, here's why this is being carried out or this is why this is being implemented or here's why this is important. Because a lot of times we just don't we don't see that see it from that lens. So it's that's part of my uh, my job, too, is to help portray that that vision or that intent from that top command level to the troops so they can better understand it because a lot of where the gripes the the rumors where a lot of the discontent comes from it's it's a lack of information it's when when we they don't have the information it becomes a vacuum and we it, we uh, tend to create the narrative and it usually is not a positive one and it's usually far from accurate so I try to do a uh, fill in as many of those blanks as possible and also pro provide people with the insight so they, they kind of understand what the process is and they feel included so that it, it, whether it's the, the most junior private or whoever, it doesn't matter if somebody has a question or doesn't understand. It's my job to be able to, to fill in those blanks so they, they, they understand. And that's where the buy in comes from. That's where people feel like they're a part of something and not having stuff just forced upon them. So when you. 
when you do that, it, it, it again, you're you're helping the morale, you're helping with the that cohesiveness, and then you're you're also building that that leadership capital too with your your bosses above you. And I got to throw a a little shout out and you know a little tip of the cap to my chief and assistant chief uh, Raul Ortiz and uh, Peter Towie. They uh, and this is a perfect example, and this is something so small too, but it had a tremendous effect. So the department bought brand, brand new helmet shields. You know, they, there was there was a need, so they they purchased new helmet shields, and we're trying to to really in, enforce you know standardization across the board. So it was like, yeah, we're you know we we're sending out new helmet shields. You know, everyone's to to comply with it. Figuring it's hey, we're 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 getting getting new stuff. You know, this is a positive thing. However, again, that that's the thirty thousand foot strategic view of hey, I'm getting the guys, you know, new equipment. This is great. We're, we're making progress. But here's where the problem is. And you talk about perspective and how our lenses are different. What is one of the, the biggest pieces of sentimental attachment for a firefighter or a, comp a company level officer? It's that helmet shield that carries a tremendous amount of, of symbolism. I mean, that, especially with our, our big cancer prevention initiative, we're all cleaning our, being diligent about cleaning our gear, reducing our carcinogen exposure, and um, so the the dirt, the days of the dirty, t tattered gear is over. But you know, even when we clean our uh, clean our our gear, which includes the helmet, the helmet shield still develops a patina. You know, it gets dinged, it gets scuffed, it gets scraped, it gets stained, and it tells a story. It tells the story of. It's not only the, the the company pride, which is that that whole esprit de corps that we try to foster, but it tells the story of where you've been, and and guys take a lot of pride in that. So, I and this is a, a big the helmet shields mean a lot to me personally, and I even myself I was shocked at the level of impact that this had because there was guys that were very attached to the to their their shields because they had been through the ringer with them. And I'll tell you what, there's some guys that are very positive, upbeat, that no matter what's going on, they're the guys bebopping in with a big smile on their face, just happy to be in the firehouse. And you would have thought their dog got killed after this. <laughs> so then, you know, after some some conversations and, you know, a couple other officers had had uh, that were involved in, again, providing that perspective of, hey, this is this is more than just helmet shields. This is this is pride. This is that that ownership of the job. This is that company uh, that that is that company esprit de corps that we try to to encourage and and cultivate. And this really took a blow to it. And to the credit of of the administration, they they heard the few of us out, and they amended their decision. And uh, it was, and it meant a tremendous amount to, because you think about it, the people that that care about those things, those are your, the, those are your your go getters, your, uh, your people that are that are really into the job, that are, you know, making things happen. So it's it's such a, a piece of low hanging fruit that, for the chief, is kind of a a no brainer. But for him to be able to, for both of them actually, it, to to be able to not only sit and, and hear us out. To digest that and then to to make that amendment, it speaks volumes. I mean, that's such a a small gesture that has just tremendous impact because now it's it's showing that hey, we're practicing what we preach. We 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 encourage you uh, you guys to have pride in your firehouse, pride in your neighborhood, pride in your 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 district, and we want you to to be into the job and and all these things. And this is a big symbol of that. And hey, we're we're we realize this is important to you, and we're going to allow you to continue to wear the pre you know pre previous generation of department issued shield or the guys that had gone out and bought their own as obviously as long as they met the the parameters of the helmet shield, it was all good. And to me, that that that's such a, a key piece of leadership there, where it seems like a, a small a small issue and a small gesture, but one that that has just tremendous impact tremendous impact it takes a lot of humility for a, a boss to 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 do that it takes a lot of guts to 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 redact something that they put out a lot of humility to say you know what we're going to change it back you know that takes a lot 
and talk about deploying, talk about practicing, talking about modeling behaviors. There's one right there. That, that's good. So, go ahead, go ahead. Just real quick, the thing I'll, I'll leave on is by providing that that little bit of leeway by recognizing the importance to those individuals of, of what that helmet shield represented and, al and allowing that that latitude to continue to wearing them. You want to talk about buy-in when that next initiative comes down, like they're doing uh, uniform, uh, uniforms and gear inspections as we speak right now. So you, when it comes time for that accountability and that compliance, when it comes to the things that have a, a true impact on on safety and operations, you know, like the P PPE and, you know, not so much on the uniforms, but that's, you know, representative of, of larger issues. When you, when it comes to the compliance for that, how much more likely do you think those individuals are to, to be your, your, your Johnny on the spot squared away folks that they're going to be the first ones in line, gig lines straight as an arrow, prim and proper, because you provided that little bit of latitude and you showed them that, uh, that respect, and now they're going to, in turn, you want compliance and buy-in on the more on the more important things. Well, there you go. Hundred percent, absolutely. So we talked about a bunch of things today. So I got to a couple more questions as we kind of get near the end of this. But in terms of leadership traits, because we talked about a bunch of them, from your perspective, what are either one or just a couple that come to your mind as first as as those those most info, uh, most powerful leadership traits? Uh, there's two that always come to mind for me, and I've been thinking about this a lot more lately too. So what the, the motto for my company, Fireside Training, is, empower, uh, is uh, or empowering initiative uh, through competency. And so initiative is one of my favorite words because you think about the best firefighters, the best fire officers, the, you know, the, the people that always come to mind as being that hallmark person it's initiative. They're always in the right place at the right time without having to be told. And with that comes conviction. The two of those are just dovetailed and, and married together. And having the initiative to see what need, to see what needs to be done or what's coming down the pike and putting yourself in a position to make that happen, which takes conviction. And a lot of what, what you need to do in order to make things happen because every uh, everybody's got the good idea fairies or the you know the the complaint department, but at the end of the day, it's it's the rubber's got to meet the road or nothing happens, and it takes conviction in order to put yourself out there to make things happen. And I look at the the things that I've been able to accomplish, the successes that that I've been able to to enjoy. It's because of taking that initiative initiative, which took conviction to do so. I mean, you have to be confident in uh, in yourself and just be willing to accept the arrows that are eventually going to come your way because, again, it's that old adage of the two things firefighters hate. It's the way things are and change. So it's, you're, you know, you're damned if you do and if you're damned if you don't. So you, you, as long as you go in under that premise, if you start at that, it's going to make everything else you do that much easier. Because if you say it's, there's always going to be somebody that's going to complain. I might as well make a positive impact. And then I'm going to deal with the complaints no matter what. So as long let's let's move the needle forward. And then that, that's that's because that's all that matters. So if you, as long as you you have that that perspective going in and is as, as long as your your intentions are pure and your actions are, are always devoted to the mission and to the, the membership in the community. That that's all that that that's that's your compass, that's your compass, and it just we we just have to commit to action. It's that that the Marine Corps always says that that bias for action, and that to me that's initiative and conviction, all in a nutshell. I, not only do I like the words, I like your definition you use for initiative. I like the, the always being in the right place in the right time without being told. That that's. <laughs> If I'm going to remember another thing, that's probably it right there. That That's good stuff, man. And I appreciate here's my, that. <laughs> here's my tactic tidbit for the uh, the company officers out there. So it, we're initiative. It, you have to be tempered with your initiative, too. You still it has to be coordinated. Um, you can't you, we can't just be off you know, freelance and doing our own thing. We have to, you know, 
develop the relationships and make sure that we're communicating. So our, our efforts are coordinated and, you know, again, always directed towards towards the mission. But on the fire ground, I always I my I strove to uh, to strive to make my company the go to company when I was uh, the lieutenant on engine one, and I wanted to be that company that when the chief turned around and was looking for somebody for that that tough assignment to get to get the job done, I wanted my crew to be the one that he that he was looking for engine one. It was no question in his mind that he was where where's where's engine one. That was my my goal, and. For for me, I, I called it, um, uh, you know, pr- uh, pr- uh, you know, priming uh, priming the chief. When I saw when I w- arrived on scene, if we weren't first due, and we we I wanted to get us into a good assignment, and I could see that the chief was was fully engaged, and I saw a job that needed to get done, I'd go up to the chief and say, Hey, chief, my crew's ready to go. Would you like me to do A B C? Would you like me to get a line up above? And Knowing that, hey, that's the next priority item that needs to get done, and now I'm t- essentially teeing it up for him to take that off his plate. You know, I've never been turned turned down unless there was something that I didn't see. Uh, but if it was if it was the right play, it was always be like, yes, go get it done. So is you're kind of just you're you're pri- priming you're priming the chief. So you're again that's that leading up the chain of command. I now took something off his plate to say. Hey, he recognized that there's something that a priority item that needs to get done. Go get it done. And lo and behold, we always seem to to get a a primo assignment. So that's, but that was from cultivating those relationships. That was developing that reputation, that reliability by doing all the little things right consistently. You know what? You know it's the the, the truck checks. You know, do, uh, training every day, and you know our past performance. So it's all the being able to do those, as you say, the sexy things on the fire ground, you have to do the not so sexy things very well on a consistent basis. So it's being squared away with your uniform every day, you know, making sure that the truck checks get done, that the paperwork gets uh, gets gets filed and that you're squared away in every other aspect, because when that time comes, the chief knows that they can rely on you because you've proven it day in and day out with all the small things. That's why, like, listen, I, I'm I'm not the biggest uniform guy, but I'm wearing my uniform as it's intended because that's what's expected of me. And if whether it's wearing the uniform, whether it's scrubbing a toilet, how you conduct yourself and how you do the jobs that you're responsible for speaks volumes to your character and how you do everything you know how we do the little things is how we do everything and that that's it speaks volumes so that's where and i I try to impart this on my kids all the time too is whether it's the their penmanship on their homework or uh, you know keeping the room clean it's hey how you conduct yourself is a reflection of your character and also with you being my kids you're a reflection of your 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 mom and, and myself so that's it's important for us to remember that that it's how we do the little things is how we do everything. So it's it's putting those deposits in the bank every day, so that way when that fire comes, you can make that withdrawal to get that primo assignment. Excellent. So as we kind of come near the end of this, one of the questions I, I've I've actually enjoyed asking is um we've done a lot of positives, a lot of high level things here, but does anything. Are there any concerns for you in the fire service? In other words, is there anything that keeps you up at night? Um, this is kind of a, a double-edged sword in the sense that I think we're in this, this I think Chief Halton used the term one time, we're in this, this renaissance of information in the mm. fire service right now, where with all of the studies that have been done, the technology that's out there, the free flow of information with social media and the amount of conferences that there are out there, especially you know, uh, regionally and just local conferences that have brought a lot of these national speakers to the to the to the forefront and bringing them all over the country. So now we're not kind of just siloed into our own little little regions. You know, we're getting that that free flow of information, you know, nation and worldwide, really. But with that, it, it's we got to make sure that it's just like you know, Elkhart had made that that. Pen that says, you know, we're 
uh, we're dr uh, drowning in, in it, uh, drowning in information, but starving for wisdom. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just important too that we we don't drown in all of that information. That we we make sure that we're we're taking that information, we're we're culling it down, we're vetting it. And it, Bruce, Bruce, I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher it, but I'm gonna try and paraphrase Bruce Lee as much as I can. But he basically had this line of saying, you know, absorb, uh, you know, absorb everything that you can. You know, apply what's practical and discard the rest. That's really what all this, this boils down to. So just making sure that we don't get oversaturated and lost in the, the weeds of all of this information that we make sure that we, we first and foremost, that we vet the information that that's, that's coming out and that we then kind of overlay it with our, our environment with our building stock, with our resources, with our uh, operating procedures and our capabilities, you know, what does that look like? Is this practical and applicable to, to my scenario? And then distilling it down and figuring out how we can, how and if we can use it to enhance our, our performance, enhance our, del our service delivery to the communities that we serve. So that's that's the, the thing is that we just gotta make sure that we're, we're tempering all of this, 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 this free flow of information and making sure that we're we're using it for good and that we're not getting just consumed or or lost by the volume. So it's that it's that whole concept of of depth over breadth. You know, we're not we're not just being flooded with with just information that may not be uh, practical. That we're just using what using what we can and discarding the rest. Some things down here. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, I'm glad you you finished up with that in terms of the uh, Holland's comment of Renaissance information. That's what we're dealing with right now. It's just so much of it out there, and I'm glad you you echoed some of the things we talked about earlier today. So yeah, there's a lot of it out there, and being able to parse through it all is is a undertaking on its own. So so we're coming kind, of, kind of close to the end here. So as we kind of come close, but um, what are the next things for you out there? I know you're you're teaching a lot out there, but where where are we going to see you next? Where are you at uh, coming up? I'm going out to Gig Harb. Uh, well, actually, the next one is in Texas. Uh, Chief Scott Thompson was gracious enough to invite me down to the colony to uh, spend a week with uh, with the, his, his folks down there. So I'm excited to do that and meet up with uh, a handful of, of friends that I had made when uh, I taught last year down in, in Plano. So I'm excited to get back down in the uh, that area and spend some time and uh, with, with them and, and catch up with some some old uh, old friends. So that's the ne the next stop for me, and luckily that's going to be followed up by a family vacation. So again, making sure that we're maintaining that that work life balance, that and we're taking that that time to to break away, to just cut loose and and have fun, spend time with friends and family, and uh, you know, got a, a nice little little pause after uh, a trip to uh, one last trip to Gig Harbor next month in the Seattle area, and then I'm shutting down for the summertime to just enjoy the the pool and the beach with the family and. And that's just un unwind for that. The summertime is my my favorite time of the year. And, you know, being a New Englander, we we have four very distinct seasons and we go from one extreme to the other. So we go from hot and humid during the summertime to bitterly cold and, and, and windy during the wintertime. So it, I'm a I'm a fair fair weather uh, person and uh, I, I very much enjoy the, the summertime and try to take as much out of it as I can. So I'm looking forward to spending some family time and out in the sun. That's, that's going to be the next couple months. Family first, man. It's one thing to say family first, but we got to act on it as well. So yeah, I'm, I'm in the same boat with you, man. The summertime, I'm looking forward to that, just to focus on family. And and luckily for me, I get to be in my pool 365 days a year. So come December and January, I'll be making sure to send you a picture of us having fun in the pool. Yeah, yeah, just to, just to throw it out there. I, I'm a Florida guy. I love Florida. I'm, I'm very biased. And I, I don't get to see the cool seasons like you do, but you know, we got to enjoy where we're at. So exactly. <laughs> Um, all right, so we're kind of wrapping up here. So any any final thoughts? We, we talked about a, a a ton of great stuff here today between everything from the fact that, you know, the, the, we're social creatures, we're fostering relationships everywhere we go, and that's why we do what we do. We're not some sort of Gandalf or Yoda or some sort of gurus. We want the interaction. We want the relationship. We want people to ask us questions. And we're doing this because it is for the, the fire service. And we talked about the, the fostering of those relationships talked about your book and how that became from an article and the chapter into a book. And I think it's important just to reiterate to the people out there to listen one more time. If you got that passion or you got that niche or you see the gap 
and you're interested in that and you have a knowledge base and you're interested in filling it, write an article or do something about that. We, we, we like to see that. We talked about the shared experience. We talked about the hobbies we were talking about and how that's a, a way for us to uh, do something outside the fire service to cope with the stresses and to just, uh, you know, the, the ones you mentioned in terms of the ones that give us the ability to, to disconnect and focus while we're doing them, which is, I think was pretty powerful. And then we talked about a bunch of other things. I mean, this was this was a long, great conversation. And the notes I took, I think each part of this, I'm going to be contemplating after this. Uh, we're, we're, we're done here. Um, so as we kind of start coming near the end, what are your final thoughts, man? So this is where we're going to tie in the coffee piece. And I'm, I'm, <laughs> we're going to tie the coffee. Good. I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> really, I'm really excited about this because when you first asked me to, to come on the podcast, I was really excited about it because I, I really enjoy our, our conversations because we're very much on the, on the same wavelength on a lot of things. And it, I, I there's a, a really a high-end coffee roaster that finally came into to our city. I've been waiting for 15 years for a good coffee shop to open up in, in my city <laughs> and finally, finally got it. And the, another just uh, this place is a gem uh, alvarium roaster in, in new britain and the you want to talk about true artisanship this is this is not some fly-by-night operation this is a a legit coffee roaster operation and i love going in there and, and talking shop and it, it it it's nostalgic to you know a, a more simpler time where you you go in there and you just chop it up with the the people that's that a true mom and pop local coffee shop where very quickly they 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 learn my name very quickly learn the coffee that i drink so they go hey you know good morning nick hey, yeah you know medium light roast yeah yeah, yeah. so and, and just that that personable exchange and that that personal experience is huge but and i developed a really great friendship with the 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 head roaster and the uh, the, the manager who who runs the the coffee shop and I'm constantly picking his brain about things. And one of the days I, I walked in there, he introduced me to a, another fellow roaster. And this happened on two other occasions, but the most recent one I think was what struck out and kind of honed me in on where I wanted this conversation to go was they were, the guy who had st stopped by, a fellow roaster, always brings a, an interesting uh, coffee with him for them to to cup and to try out and they'll sit there and, and dissect it and talk about the, the 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 flavor notes of the coffee and you know the from everything how it smells to the how it first tastes when it hits your tongue and then the, the flavor that it leaves you with on the finish and you know talking about how they extracted it and you know how it was roasted i mean really just getting into the weeds on just the everything from inception of of plant to drink drinking the cup the cup of coffee in your hands and it struck me i'm like man we're talking about a drink here something as, as simple as coffee and i looked at the level of competency the the community aspect that was involved here and then the collaboration between these two professionals so we'll start start with the, that first piece there the competency aspect these two guys didn't just say ah it's we're just making coffee everybody's had coffee before you just it's it's, it's gr grinds in water it's so simple i've done that before Does that sound familiar steve <laughs> you just you just pour water over grinds what's the big deal i've done that before no these are true professionals these are true artisans that know their craft inside and out they know they, they these guys know the farmers they know the 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 topography and the, and the type of soil that the, the the plants are being planted in they know about the variety of the coffee they know about the um you know that how they how that translates to the best way to roast it and then how it's going to bring out the different the different flavor notes and the flavor profile and you know the best ways to extract it and we're talking about coffee now translate that to the fire service where we're dealing with people's livelihoods. You know, we're tasked with protecting people's life and property, but yet there are some out there that will just minimize that to whether it's stretching lines, throwing ladders, you name it. I've done that before. What's 
you know, don't oh don't overcomplicate that. You know, what's the big deal? No, we need to be just like their artisans. We need to be craftsmen of our trade of the fire service and treat that with the same level of professionalism, the same diligence that and again, I'm, I'm not trying to trivialize their 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 craft and their art form of making coffee because that's the elixir of life. And, and in my in my world, that's you know, I, I live coffee cup to coffee cup. So that's it, it's a great importance to me. But you you talk about the what's at stake in the grand scheme of things and if these professionals can treat their their craft which is to provide a, a, a in essence a recreational beverage if they can treat it with that that level of of significance shouldn't we be doing the same thing as a as a fire service industry so the, and then just the community and collaboration aspect too here's two roasters that in in, in essence are their competing interests, but yet they're not lording and hoarding their their trade secrets and information. They're collaborating. They're they're creating this community and sharing other coffees, sharing their processes and their you know ideas of you know how they go about doing it. And again, that should that's should what we what we should be doing in the fire service is constantly collaborating, sharing with each other, building each other up, and developing that same that same uh, type of an environment. And the thing I just love about coffee is it, coffee is this amazing thing that transcends all aspects of society. It is social gravity is kind of the thing that came to my head that I wrote down as, as we were getting, getting uh, ready for this. It's just like the meals. It brings everybody together at the table. And, and that's what I, I love. I love about it. There's so many commonalities with food and drink. And, you know, I, 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 we, you know, New Britain's a, a pretty diverse community, and you know the fire the firefighters are are you know equally diverse. And but the one thing that brings everybody together are the are the, the meals and and the coffee, and it's just amazing how it breaks down all those those you know barriers, if you will. And it's just a way for everybody. It's that co it's that common that common ground, if you will, to to bring everybody together. No pun intended. Yeah. No pun intended. No pun common ground. Said. Yeah. So, and that's that, that's where I kind of wanted to just leave it is that that sentiment is if if we are to be the the professionals that we uh, that we profess to be, then we need to make sure that we're taking that initiative, that we're having that conviction day in and day out to do what needs to be done to keep moving that that needle forward, to keep holding up our end of the bargain and, and making good on that oath that we all took to make sure that we're we are are protecting life and property the best of our ability each and every time that we put that uniform on and show up to work because that's that's what's expected of us and, and that's what the public demands and we we can't we can't fall short on that because again i'm not again not to, to to minimize but this we're not dealing with cups of coffee here and you know if somebody makes a bad cup of coffee it's just an unhappy customer. If we if, if we make a bad cup of coffee, that's somebody's livelihood that's at stake here. And we we and not to to try and make this this grandiose thing, but this is really what we're dealing with here. And we we got to make sure that we're we don't ever lose sight of that or, or minimize that. And I I'm gonna leave it right there. I got I don't I don't even know how to follow that up. I think you 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 ended this brilliantly and beautifully i think it sums it all up and I, i'm just really glad we we had this chance to, to to collaborate and to to talk about this stuff i think that like you said we're we're definitely cut from the same cloth and it's nice to talk to somebody uh that, that you bond with from across the country and i think that goes back to the relationships we 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 find we find you you bond with people across the country whether it's local california wherever and this is one of those conversations so on that note i'm not going to take it much further i think that you just summed it up beautifully so nick thank you for for doing this with me thank you for being on this thing today i think that those that are listening are, are going to get a lot out of this one and i appreciate the the conversation um so uh, i'll i'll say you know just the thank yous as we uh, wrap things up here so thank you everybody for once again uh, listening to the perspectives on leadership podcast we know that you have a ton of different options out there. there's a zillion podcasts out there and the fact that you're listening to this one is much appreciated and i, I feel that we do provide value so thank you for that 
Um, as always, thank you to Fire Engineering. Thank you to Clarion. Thank you for Chief Halton and, and the team uh, and, and Chief uh, Rhodes, obviously, and Diane. Thank you for letting us have this platform to do this and provide value to the fire service out there. Um, thank you to my fire department for allowing me to have this platform as well. I always love representing my Fort Lauderdale Fire Rescue Agency, and you love your, your department as well. And it's wonderful to be able to brag and, and boast about the agencies we work for because we, we, we wouldn't be here without those experiences and those relationships that they provided us over the years. So it's wonderful to get to brag about our agencies. You know, we don't, we don't get to do that enough, and it's nice to be able to brag about our, our agencies. So that all being said, uh, yeah, I guess second Friday of the month, we, we do this every month. So thank you for tuning in. Nick, thank you once again for all this. That's tr truly my pleasure, Steve. Uh, thank you for the invite. And uh, it's always great to catch up. Same here, man. All right. Well, thank you all for listening in and we'll see you next time. Have a wonderful day.